Will you please join me in welcoming His Excellency Dr. Boidiono, the Vice President of the Republic of Indonesia. Thank you very much. <coughs> One more picture to go. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Um, a fascinating topic, I'm sure you'll agree. Inclusive Asia reinvigorating the Millennium Development Goals. Obviously an enormous issue, an enormous task for not uh, just the Asian community but for, <coughs> for the global community. Um, I'll briefly outline those goals. So you will know which ones uh, we're going to be talking about. Uh, they, they were begun, as you know, the Millennium Development Goals back in 2000 with a target date, a deadline of, of 2015. There are eight goals, there are 21 targets, and there are some 60 criteria for measuring those targets. Just let me very quickly run through the, the, the eight key goals. Halving the number of people living on less than $1.25 a day achieving universal primary school education, promoting <coughs> gender equality and empowerment of women, reducing child mortality by two thirds for children under the age of five years, improving maternal health, combating AIDS, malaria and other diseases, ensuring environmental sustainability, and number eight is developing a global partnership for development. So we've just got four and a half years to go now before that 2015 deadline. We're not, I'm afraid, in 75 minutes going to comprehensively cover <coughs> all eight of those targets, but we are going to cover the ones that matter to Asia, what's being done well, what's not being done well, and why, and what we need to do now. These will be the issues that are relevant. And we have a very, very distinguished panel with us uh, this morning to discuss these, um, and I would like to particularly make a warm welcome to the Republic of Indonesian Vice President Bodiono. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, on, on my immediate left, we are joined by Thomas Stelza. He is with the United Nations, and Thomas' role is really as a lead coordinator in the UN in reaching the Millennium Development Goal targets. On the Vice President's left is Rajat Nag, who is the head of the Asian Development Bank. Sitting next to him is Tony Meloto. And for those who don't know Tony, Tony is the executive director of a uh, group called Gawad Kalinga, which, uh, as he points out, is now responsible since it began in 2003 of putting something like one million Filipinos into their own homes or access to health since 2003. <coughs> it's quite an extraordinary uh, effort by that group. A man who describes himself as a radical optimist and you'll find out uh, why uh, in the course <coughs> of this morning. And sitting next to Tony is Geoffrey Sachs, who I'm sure most people you're all familiar with here. Geoffrey is director of the uh, Earth Institute at Columbia University and also special advisor to the UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon on the Millennium Development Goals. So certainly, gentlemen, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I would, will be taking questions from the floor, and I'd just like to underline here, it's an unusual event for <coughs> us to be able to ask some questions from the floor to, for su to such a senior minister. So uh, I welcome uh, your questions. Um, we will get to them during the course of the morning. But I'd like to kick things off now with Geoffrey Sachs. And Geoffrey, perhaps you can just start by giving us a broad outline. We've got four and a half years to go now for the MDGs. How are we performing and how within that is Asia performing? Thanks very much, and uh, what an honor it is to be together with this uh, wonderful panel and uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think the Millennium Development Goals uh, have been a remarkable undertaking. The fact that the world got together 11 years ago and agreed on a holistic approach to attacking and eventually ending extreme poverty is something very unusual. Perhaps even more unusual is the fact that 11 years after these were announced, 
They are still very much at the center of national and international policy making. This usually doesn't happen with global goals. Global goals are typically stated, uh, photo op, and forgotten, uh, but not with the Millennium Development Goals. I think they've really uh, been able to find a, a major political foothold all over the world. Wherever I travel, and that's to dozens and dozens of countries every year, they're playing a guiding and powerful public and a policy role uh, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and it's very heartening. There's been lots of progress. The greatest progress is definitely in Asia. The greatest progress among the eight goals is the progress in reducing income poverty. And again, Asia is really at the center of that because of double-digit economic growth, the dramatic uh, progress in all parts of Asia, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, we're seeing great breakthroughs in the speed of economic growth, unprecedented. Other parts of the world have lagged somewhat behind, but even Sub-Saharan Africa, which has long been the most problematic part of the world, is now picking up economic growth and is, I would say, a reliable 6% per year economic growth. That doesn't sound like much to Asian ears necessarily. <laughs> But that's a big improvement in the past, the best since Africa's independence, and I think the rate is likely to grow. Asia is picking up Africa's growth. Let's be clear, this is an Indian Ocean dynamism uh, that we're experiencing, and it's a very exciting and historic breakthrough. Now, where the goals are not being uh, met, unfortunately, is in two other areas. One is when you need targeted public investments, for instance, to save mothers' lives in childbirth, uh, or to save uh, children from chronic undernourishment, where market forces alone won't do it. Market forces will leave too many people behind, or whole regions <coughs> excluded. Then we're seeing progress not being what it needs to be, even in Asia, even in the most dynamic part of the world economy. The second area where I would say the whole world is falling down right now is in MDG 7 on environmental sustainability. Let's be clear and frank. We need to invent a new global growth model, nothing short of that, that combines rapid economic growth with environmental sustainability. The world will be getting together next year at the Rio Plus 20 Summit around that challenge. This is not, unfortunately, a challenge that's going to be solved at a summit or at a meeting. It's very deep. It really means reorienting the whole growth model towards renewable energy, towards more efficient water use, towards uh, spending more on uh, clean water uh, supplies and so on. Uh, we see even in the richest countries in the world how the modern food systems can't necessarily cope often with an E. coli uh, outbreak in Germany, for example, which was quite frightening. Uh, but the deeper problems of environmental change at human hands, especially climate change, uh, is a sign that we haven't yet anywhere <laughs> achieved MDG 7. And no country alone can do it. But we've seen more droughts, floods, powerful typhoons, rising sea levels, storm surges, and other ultimately human uh, aggravated disasters taking place and this is where I would put a huge part of the challenge. So long answer to your question, but to summarize, great progress, strong political commitment, the ability to do a lot more, the need for focused public investments alongside the private growth, and the need, unfortunately, and this is a, a mouthful and a, and a big concept, the need for a new growth paradigm that combines environmental sustainability fundamentally with how we are scaling up production. Thank you. If, if I could turn to uh, Pak Bodiono to ask, as the host uh, of, the, of the WEF meeting here, how is Indonesia specifically coming along with its targets? And, and perhaps that point that uh, Jeffrey talks about, the new growth model. Indonesia is now growing strongly and will grow more strongly. Yeah. But is there a payoff that, or trade-off <coughs> that has to be made with the environment? Thank you, Mr. Sipin. First, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to Jakarta. It's, uh, I think it's our, our uh, greatest pleasure to host uh, the, the World Economic Forum here. 
uh, this time. Uh, first, let me connect to what uh, Professor Sachs mentioned, that uh, some international goals normally are forgotten after a few years pass, but MDGs have never been forgotten here in this country. It is, uh, in fact, part of our uh, medium-term uh, uh, program to, uh, of development, and all the 60-plus uh, targets are actually part of our, integrated into our uh, <coughs> medium-term plans here. So we are quite serious about that. Uh, with regard to the achievement so far, uh, four and a half years before the, the final uh, year, uh, I think I would say that uh, we have been able to uh, be on track uh, in general. And uh, I must say that most of the, the, the targets are within our reach uh, by 2015. Uh, some of them are already actually achieved by now, like uh, the uh, extreme poverty uh, target. I think we we have we have passed the the the, uh, the target by now uh, uh, by halving more than halving the the the, uh, the rate. Uh, gender equality. I think we we are we should be proud that we could announce that. Uh, gender equality in terms of in, in schooling uh, and so on uh, have been uh, achieved. In fact, uh, 100 mark of index uh, for gender uh, equality is is achieved in many areas. Uh, <coughs> in area of uh, health, also we I think we are on on the right track. But I, I have to make some notes here. There are some areas that I think we, we are now uh, focusing to, to give more attention to. Uh, that is uh, in the area of maternal mortality rates. Uh, I think a lot more need to be done in the next uh, four to five years to, to put it on track uh, to achieve the, our target. Uh, we, have done, we have been doing a lot. And the, the issue here is actually uh, about uh, to reach out these uh, mothers who, who are mainly in the uh, isolated areas. And this is, I think, our, our main occupation in the next four, five years to, to get access to them. Um, many of the uh, cause of the uh, death mother is because of during the childbearing period and I think what we need to do is to to get more access to that but hopefully we can achieve our target by <coughs> 2015. Another area is uh, notes is the uh, HIV <coughs> AIDS uh, stabilizing yes I think uh, but in fact uh, the number that new cases that we found is increasing in the past few years. This may be partly because of a better recording and so on, but I think this is a, an area that we should put more attention to. And uh, we acknowledge here the cooperation from the international uh, community. Uh, I think we, we have benefited a lot from this cooperation. Uh, we are now uh, offering a free uh, treatment for everyone who register uh, to our clinics and uh, uh, hospitals throughout the country, completely free. And I think that is a uh, thing that we, we should uh, try to continue. Uh, another area is in the area of uh, environment. Uh, Professor Sachs mentioned about environment. I, I think uh, we, we will do our part to to achieve the global uh, reduction in uh, uh, emission, CO2 emission, 26% uh, reduction by 2020. I think we'll stick to that. Hopefully we can exit. Uh, recently, you know that we, the government has, has uh, announced the kind of moratorium for conversion of forests. 
uh, land, uh, and also we we are working on on a, a big replanting uh, a program for our forest. With regard to the model, uh, I, if I may, uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, yes, we have been uh, discussing this uh, issue within Indonesia among the experts and also within the, the government. Uh, <clears throat> seven to eight percent is our our benchmark target of growth for the next or the, for the medium term. But if you look at the potential, <coughs> that's is actually is, is below our potential. We could actually grow by 9% or so, but uh, some people caution us that uh, you should not aim at that high because it may have the environmental cost on your economy. Therefore, <coughs> also the, uh, uh, <coughs> the cost on your development in the medium term uh, eventually. <coughs> so uh, we, are, we are looking into that issue, what we could do in the area of uh, compromising and growth vis a -vis, uh, environment. A clean growth model, environmentally uh, friendly model. I think we, we are working now in the area of uh, food, <coughs> energy, water, and in such a way that hopefully we can um, achieve the, the, the good balance between the two. So environmental sustainability is, is, is obviously uh, something which is very high on, on the, this government's agenda. Uh, Mr. Nag, the, you've, you've done plenty of research, the bankers and the ADB has done plenty of research on, on the MDCs, on the on MDGs, excuse me. Wh what have you found? Uh, does, your, does your research uh, bear out uh, what Jeffrey's just been saying? Uh, certainly does. Uh, but before that, Andrew, if I may, uh, thank again uh, Babu Diono and colleagues to have me on the panel with them. And Andrew, one minor but important correction. I don't head ADB, President Kuroda does. I am very proud to be a member of his team. <laughs> but thanks for that appointment for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, very much in line with what Professor Sachs has said uh, in terms of the overall assessment. But you see, in Asia Pacific, the numbers are so huge that even when we are meeting the MDG target, say on income poverty, as Jeffrey said, I think it's important to recognize that more than 900 million people in Asia uh, live below a dollar 25 a day. Uh, on basic water, uh, access to water, again, where Asia will meet the target, but still 450 million people are without access to clean water. And on targets which we are not on track on, at the moment at least, say sanitation, it's about 1.9 billion. And uh, echoing what the Vice President said, uh, about a quarter of a million mothers die at childbirth annually in Asia, and 100 million children are malnourished. So, yes, very much agree with Professor Sachs' overall assessment. Uh, Asia is on track on several uh, MDGs, particularly on income, uh, basic sanitation, gender parity, not on track on universal primary education, health in particular. So the challenge for Asia is we've got four and a half years to go, and what Babu Diona mentioned about Indonesia, we certainly feel about uh, Asia as a whole, that we can meet the targets uh, in the next four and a half years, but it will need a huge amount of investments, both from the public and the private sector, uh, both in infrastructure and the social sector. And one critical element of this whole fight to achieve MDGs will be good governance, which you had alluded to, and I'll come back later. So we are cautiously optimistic. Uh, it is plausible, but as I keep saying, not preordained. Th thank, thank you, um, and apologies for that. Um, Thomas, <coughs> sitting in New York with the United Nations, you were responsible, or you had a lot to do with, with pulling together the New York Summit 2010, <coughs> to, uh, 10 years after the, the launch of the MDGs. Um, that was partly to, to assess and partly to reinvigorate. How successful has it been? And is the world back on target again? Has it, has it renewed its commitments and the world as well as Asia? The summit, 
last year's MDG Summit was an amazing event uh, for several uh, aspects. First, it was the first stakeholder <coughs> summit, bringing together not only representatives of government, but the stakeholder community, which is quite well represented in this panel here. We have government, we have financial institution, we have the civil society, we have academia. We have learned that to implement the, the, the land development goals, you really have to bring all the stakeholders together. Now, the summit as such took stock. What have we done in the last 10 years? What have we learned? What can be applied to the last phase, the last five years? And the heads of governments and states uh, <coughs> in New York have agreed upon a very ambitious action plan a clear strategy that could bring us ahead towards the fulfillment of the goals. Now, whether we implement that, whether this summit becomes dead wood as so many of the UN decisions and achievements, or whether we really move forward, that we're, we'll, will really depend on us. We know exactly what it needs. It needs political commitment, which is obviously there in many countries. It needs clear strategies, which are all summarized in the outcome document and it needs financial contributions. Now, with this package, we can achieve it. And this region here, East Asia and Southeast Asia, have proved that it's possible to really halve poverty within the 15-year deadline. The numbers here are quite impressive. You know, a reduction in East Asia from 60% to 16% foreseeable. In Southeast Asia, from 39% to 9%, to 19%. Of course, China will reduce it to 5%, but the region as a whole has been doing very well. Also, in halving hungry people, that's one of the biggest issues. You know, in a world of abundance, we have a billion people who go to bed hungry, who do not enjoy food security, children who do not enjoy food security. <coughs> this region has done very well because they have invented, there were targeted interventions, a clear focus on what needs to be done. And in fact, with the leadership of Indonesia, and also the Philippines. The numbers are quite good in child nutrition uh, in this region, which is very important because when children are born with less than 2,500 grams, they can never catch up. Mm. And there are regions in the world where quite a high number of children uh, is malnourished in the first years. So they are stunted. They can never catch up in their life. So no matter whether we provide them with inclusive development, with equitable growth, they will just not be able to to take advantage of their opportunities because they were disadvantaged at the beginning. And, and what is Asia's, specifically Asia's biggest challenge, do you think, from the summit uh, in 2010 to meet its targets, specifically <coughs> Asia? As Professor Schwab said yesterday at the opening session uh, of this uh, World Economic Forum in Asia, it's sustainability. You know, how do we grow sustainably, predictably, how do we really realign our resources? And especially in the light of preparations for Rio Plus 20 next year, where we are facing the biggest of all the challenges, the 50-50-50 challenge. That means in 2050, 50% more people than 10 years ago will live on this planet. At the same time, we need to reduce greenhouse gases by 50% to stay within the agreed target of two degrees uh, 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 warming. But, but it's a huge challenge. What about the political will in Asia, the, the, the wherewithal for financing, the, the, those problems you spoke about? Are, is, are, is that surmountable here? Is that a problem here? Well, the political will is, is clearly there in many of the countries. In Asia. And uh, where it's not there, you know, the, the UN has this great convening power. Political leaders come to New York and very often they commit to big targets and then when they leave New York, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, with all their locally and uh, national <coughs> problems, they sometimes uh, do not really follow up to what they've promised to New York. So our problem of compliance with commitments is a big one. And this is where civil society comes in here, to make us aware civil society has goals which are more sustainable than the few-year electoral cycle sometimes. Can you That's name a very name? important role. Sorry, can, sorry quick, can, could, you na could you name, could you point to a country in, in Asia and say you are lagging behind for on political will? Well, as the United Nations, we never check, single out countries, check one, of course. Two, check. And uh, <laughs> in democratic societies, it's up check. to civil society to choose their own <laughs> leaders. And I think this is very important. You know, we need to tell our leaders what is important for us. 
And uh, the Milan Development Goals have become really a cultural heritage. We know about that. In many, in big parts of the world, people live with the MDGs. And this is the summit, you know, galvanized political will and brought the world together to really channel all the energy towards the last five years. It's a huge opportunity, and we will have to take advantage of it. Tony Maloto, um, we, we, we're obviously going to be talking quite a lot about financing and about developing and public-private partnership. You, uh, in the Philippines, seem to be writing the book on that at the moment, about how to alleviate poverty, lifting people out of poverty, giving them dignity, giving them hope. Just um, what, what, for, what are the key lessons you've learned about, about attracting private equity into this and convincing government they need to be a part of it? Um, Your Excellency, Mr. Vice Chef. President, and my honoured colleagues here. And to answer that, uh, Andrew, I Chef, one, two. would like to speak uh, as, a, as a person from the ground. Check one, because two, we're check. really doing massive uh, ground-up development because in many instances uh, uh, one, two, it takes a long time for, for, for development to trickle down. But I speak also for the millions of good people in this world who are working with NGOs and the, all the social entrepreneurs and also the big business and government leaders, good government leaders who want to help them. Because uh, we realize that we need a build philosophy, you know, that uh, you just connect with the good in people. You know, and uh, there are enough critics and cynics in this world. You know? uh, so it's important for us also to really pursue a positive vision. And when the MDGs articulated their vision to, uh, to have poverty by 2015, in the, the year 2000, that was a clear Check. signal for us. Check. We also okay. started Fine. to think of a vision for our own country, that we can end poverty in our country. So by cooperating with government in achieving the uh, MDGs, but going beyond that, so in 2003, we launched a global campaign to end poverty in the Philippines in 21 years, 2024. And this is through public-private partnership, but also by, by showing proof of concept. So in, uh, in, since the time, we have uh, been working on 2,000 communities impacting the lives of about a million people. And as a result, uh, we now have uh, a new government uh, that ha has uh, trust and with very competent and uh, and uh, visionary leaders. And yesterday I was very affirmed and uh, inspired uh, listening to the president of Indonesia. Uh, after seven years, they have achieved so much uh, in terms of gaining global trust and also uh, providing you know, uh, opportunities for, for, for investors to come in. But uh, our government is barely one year old, and so it gives me a lot of hope uh, that it can be done. So, now, our role is to be a bridge you know, between the poor and the rich, between the government and the private sector, that we have to show that the private sector must embrace MDGs and go beyond it. Because you know, it is not just the job of government alone. But if uh, we can, uh, uh, without, uh, uh, try, with, without seeking power and without seeking wealth ourselves, that we can actually create wealth for those at the bottom of the pyramid. So now, uh, we are working with corporations to go beyond CSR but to go for CSI, Corporate Social Investment. But when you work with these corporations, how, how do you get them on board? Well, by this showing, not, by this showing is not them, altruism, is it? By showing them that investing in, uh, in reducing poverty uh, makes good business sense because it will enhance buying power and expand the market base. And uh, by also working in the countryside together with government, we will reduce insurgency that is rooted in poverty. And so the first, in our framework of development, we focus in the first seven years on achieving social justice through peaceful means. And that is just creating shared value between the poor that we want to help and the corporations and government that wants to help them. But if we demand our government to be honest, we as private citizens must be honest ourselves because uh, we need to really help the uh, uh, regain the trust of our people in government. But we ourselves who are working to help uh, and poverty in our country must be trusted by government uh, ourselves. Mm. And you had something like 500 corporations you, who, are, you, who are now partnering um, yes. for a group. I'm just curious, Je Jeffrey Sachs, is, is, is this, does the Philippines represent uh, a standout success <laughs> or are we seeing more and more public-private partnership now in this area? I think, uh, and especially uh, at a World Economic Forum, this concept of public-private partnership is, is vital. Uh, and I think uh, Tony's success is exemplary, uh, and a lot more can be done. We've had great public-private partnership on some of the disease control initiatives. 
malaria, AIDS, TB are cases where the public sector stepped up with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. The private sector stepped up with providing new technologies, low-cost solutions, uh, and uh, sometimes producing at cost with zero profit. And it's been a wonderful uh, partnership in this way. Uh, there are many companies in this room that are <clears throat> stepping forward with lots of very important initiatives on sustainability, and the public sector needs to come in and help support those initiatives and scale them up. Another sector that I think has played an exemplary role is uh, the ICP, <laughs> inter uh, the uh, Information and Communications Technology sector. The, the mobile phone has been perhaps the greatest driver of development that I've seen in the last 20 years because one of the essences of poverty is isolation uh, and being outside of market information, outside of, uh, uh, of the knowledge flows. And the mobile phones change that, even for the most remote places in the world. Everybody's connected. And so the, the private sector role is essential and proving itself. There is business at the bottom of the pyramid and a lot of it. But the public sector role is vital as complementary to that. And it differs case by case. But I think putting the two together is really at the core of success. Uh, uh, Pak Poriano, on the, 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 the public role, how active now is your government in, in pushing <coughs> these, these programs forward? Uh, are you doing it, are you looking, actively looking for private partnership as you go along? Yes. Uh, uh, I think the role of the private sector and the uh, community themselves in uh, solving these uh, social problems, uh, poverty and so on, uh, is indispensable. The government alone cannot reach out <coughs> uh, those who are uh, needing uh, the, the uh, uh, support and help. Government here, uh, Mr. Stevens, we, we have a central uh, program that focus on what the government could do uh, as, as government in terms of uh, eliminating poverty and uh, providing uh, basic uh, services for the, the people. But beyond that, I think uh, the, the, the community itself, themselves, uh, the private sector, uh, they should be uh, embraced so that the, this uh, effort will become movement. Movement, uh, when th this is exactly our strategy. We, we are trying to embrace them. Uh, uh, become national movement to eradicate poverty, to supply the basic services, uh, education and, and health, and so on. And it is working now. Uh, we, we have been quite <coughs> successful, in, uh, in a sense, and having a public-private partnership in building infrastructure. But now, I think in social programs too, we, we, we are thinking and we see that there are the interests there that uh, the business people are uh, joining the government now. We, I, I, I'm in charge of directing the whole national uh, poverty eradication program in this country. And my office uh, has had <coughs> received a lot of uh, inquiries and interest among our uh, uh, business community here to, to, to participate. And they ask uh, the question, what, what could we do in, in, the, uh, in the bigger framework of uh, the government uh, program? How can we fit in into this? And it's happening now. Yeah. Uh, Roger, how does the ADB fit into this, in, into the financing needs and in, right. into building? Uh, I think, Andrew, uh, reading your question to a point that you also asked, Thomas, uh, we think there is a lot of political commitment in Asia to meeting the MDGs, and it's almost sort of universal. Uh, all governments feel is very important and are committed. What I think is lacking, or to varying degrees, is a sense of urgency. Uh, we've got only four and a half years to go, and we have a long way to go. And the numbers that I quoted are quite staggering. So I think there has to be a huge amount of public sector investments and 
public-private partnerships, no doubt. And in terms of the finances, ADB, uh, the World Bank, other institutions certainly are providing more resources. We, for example, have almost tripled our lending uh, over the last six, seven years. Uh, and yet, it is a drop in the ocean. Our estimates show, for example, that the 14 least developed countries in Asia Pacific need about $8 billion a year just to meet the MDGs. So the needs are huge. And we certainly will keep ramping up to the extent we can within our capital limitations. But I should make a point that in Asia, the average taxes collected as a percentage of GDP is slightly under 10%. In the developed world, it's easily 20%. So there's a huge amount of public resource mobilization which needs to happen, not just by raising tax rates, but by increasing the tax base, improving the tax collection, going back to governance. And I keep going back mm -hmm. to it because I think without good governance, you will not have good development and you will not be able to reach the MDGs. So it has to be tied in in a very comprehensive manner with public investment, public-private partnerships, and good governance, including fighting corruption. Hey, Tony Melito, I mean, good governance. How, how, do, you, how do you maintain uh, graft-free, or as much as you can, uh, development? In, in, you know, you're dealing now with, with millions and millions of dollars, lots of development. How do you do governance at, 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 your, at that level, at that grassroots level? Well, as uh, most often we emphasize on good governance, but seldom do we emphasize good citizenship. <laughs> and uh, so we realize that we have to really build sustainable communities, you know, that is a good platform for good citizenship, productivity, and wealth creation. And, uh, and uh, government will become honest if our citizens will also be honest. Just like, uh, you know, technology is doing a lot in our country. Like last election, because of automation, we had the most honest, the fastest, and the most peaceful election. But do, what, are, what measures do you have in place? do you put in place to, to, to make sure that money goes where it needs to go? Well, the thing here is that we've worked with over 400 mayors, governors, we work with the national government, and I have not met a corrupt <coughs> official yet, simply because, of course, the, the, the terms of engagement must be honest, must be transparent, and you must show proof of, of, of uh, results, and you must be accountable. So we try to leverage the limited resources of government with also contribution from the private sector, and that's what we facilitate. And so it's important also for NGO leaders to really show accountability, show transparency, and show they should not have any you know, personal agenda for, for power or profit themselves. But this is the thing. We're now really promoting social businesses that, uh, to raise a new generation uh, of, of, of our countrymen who should not just be job seekers abroad, but wealth creators at home, because we keep losing the brightest and the best of our people mm. and abandoning us and leaving us with, the, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with people that are uh, on welfare and people we need to care for. And so while well, the government now will do uh, its best, it's important for us now, also our educational system, not just to gear up our education to supply the global job market, but to really uh, create good citizens and because from our universities will come also our future politicians and businessmen. So create, yes, create the, the, the whole cycle. Je Jeffrey Sachs, I mean, uh, uh, governance, as uh, Roger uh, Nag points out, is, is, is a major issue. Uh, Tony doesn't see too much of it at, at his level. What do you see? And, and what's the most effective way? I mean, it is a blight. It is worldwide. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to pick up on uh, what Rajat said, which I think is extremely important, um, and that is about uh, public finance. You know, if you look around the whole world at uh, which countries have really achieved the triple bottom line of uh, high economic levels, social uh, equality, and environmental sustainability, I think if, if you do a worldwide scan of uh, to my view, it is uh, the Scandinavian countries in Northern Europe that have come closest to that triple bottom line. Uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, uh, Germany. How do they do that? They pay for it. They tax themselves. They use the government proceeds to fight poverty, to fight uh, undernutrition of young people, early childhood development programs. They don't fight the market. These are very open economies. They're very competitive economies. They use government revenue to invest heavily in R&D. 
so that they're at the world cutting edge of knowledge. And to my mind, that is a wonderful combination. It shows that the market goes so far. They're all totally market economies, but they also say, well, wait a minute. The market plus the social plus the environmental is the combination that's needed. You can't get that for free. My own country, the United States, wants it for free. We're on a constant tax cutting binge. The rich want no taxes. They say, let the market do it. But we end up without the social policy. We have lots of poverty. We end up without the environmental policy. You'll notice the United States won't sign critical protocols for the globe right now because the rich want it all for free. And if they do that, they're going to pull the whole world down. I think what's really true, like it or not for Asia, by the way, is Asia's going to have to lead right now. Uh, the U.S. isn't leading right now because it's got its own internal political bottlenecks, 10 percent of GNP budget deficit because uh, the rich fight taxes and we can't pay for government. Europe is struggling between North and South. The North is working. The South undertaxes itself and has a fiscal crisis. That leaves Asia to lead, frankly. Uh, maybe Asia doesn't want to lead that way, but it's going to have to lead. Uh, and I think uh, what, what Rajat said is completely on the mark. Leadership requires resources in government, not only in the market. Asia is dynamic in the marketplace, and it needs to be dynamic in the government sector as well. Let's put that to Thomas, though. You, at the meeting last year, the summit, did you detect a, 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 a a more of a leadership role coming from Asia? Are they stepping up? The summit has only been back uh, a few months. So our numbers are always lagging behind a little bit. So we don't have hard evidence. The MDG report 2011, which just went into print last week, which I still cannot share with you, because the Secretary General is going to introduce it on the 7th of July in Geneva. But some of the findings are quite positive uh, from this report. <coughs> the report shows us that targeted intervention works, and we can do it if we really concentrate on it. But Andrew, may I return uh, just a minute to this public-private partnerships? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's such a privilege. It's my first time participating in the World Economic Forum. And during the last two days, I've met so many business leaders who were ready and uh, ambitious to contribute to the motto, improving the state of the world. And there are a lot of good examples where cooperation with the business sector works, like our fight against malaria. One of our most important achievements are the bed nets, uh, distributing 230 million bed nets in, in, in Africa to protect children and people from uh, from malaria. Yeah. Now, that would not have been possible without cooperation with the private sector. <coughs> One of the big challenges also in Asia is the lack of sanitation. We have made great progress in providing people with fresh water. You know, here Asia is really exemplary and ahead. But we have not been able to provide people with sanitation. There are still 2.6 billion people in the world who do not have access to flush toilets or to any advanced sanitation. There are more than a billion people who practice open defecation with all the consequences of sanitation to health problems. Now, how can you build two point, two, you know, a billion toilets uh, to benefit these people? Only with partnerships with industry. And then, of course, there are business opportunities in there. So I think this is very important to work together to uh, define strategies where we can really come together uh, to implement uh, the Middle Development Goals. And if it's happening. It is happening. It is happening, but it has to, Not as fast it as has to like be it to accelerated. <laughs> uh, it is happening slowly at United Nations. You know, we are slowly recognizing do, that... Do the governments realize they need to step this up to do the private partnership as well uh, and are not, or is it just a slow process to get to, to wrap it up? It's slow processes, you know, recognizing what is in our interest. You know, this is the business of the United Nations, moderating between interests, mm. helping people to understand that cooperation is in their own interest, because otherwise we do not achieve cooperative, comprehensive solutions to the huge global challenges. Okay, I'd just like to uh, go to Pak uh, um, Suryono. Something that Jeffrey Sachs said, Suryono, do you think that Asia, Asians pay too little tax that the 
or is it a fact that tax collection is too inefficient here? Do you think, realistically, if we are going to pay to have a sustainable world, that tax rates in Asia generally have to go up? Well, I, I can speak on for Indonesia. Actually, I think we are still under tax. I agree. Under tax in the sense that uh, the basis, tax basis is is still narrow, and I think there are still areas that uh, we, we can uh, improve our tax performance, and that is the key, I agree with uh, Professor Sachs, that uh, in area like this, development, uh, social development, uh, environment, and so on, and even in general, uh, uh, of the uh, economic development in general, I think the role of government is, is vital. Um, I belong to the school that I think government should play the appropriate role, and even in, especially in the social program, should intervene proactively. And this requires financing, and that I think has to be uh, has to come from from our our own resources. And we, we have plenty. We have natural resources, uh, exported, untaxed, uh, or very lightly taxed. This kind of thing, I think, we can still. Uh, actually uh, what you call collect uh, the ref uh, revenues and to finance the social programs. But of course, as you touched on li uh, before, uh, Mr. Stephens, that to be an effective lead in this kind of uh, effort, the government should, should be a good government. You have to, to be an effective government, a clean government, and this is the key. Uh, I think uh, money is part, is, is <coughs> important, but I think also the way to, to collect and to use the money is very, very important. Absolutely. Coming back to governance, yeah. uh, uh, Rajat Nag, um, in your opinion, how much of an improvement across Asia are we seeing in governance? I think on that point, we can say that is very encouraging progress. First, because I think the recognition of the problem is quite universal. I think. Uh, the political leadership across the entire spectrum have recognized good governance is key for good development. And also, I think, the recognition that good governance is not just about corruption. I think for a while, we all got very caught up in a very small element of it. Good governance is accountability. I think Tony made a very important point about good citizenship. So I must say that on all scores, Asia is improving but not enough. I think we certainly have a long way to go, and that, I think, is the challenge. And I'm very, very encouraged to hear Vice President Bodhiono himself assert and reassert that point. Okay. Um, we, I just <coughs> would like to open this up to the floor as well. We, we've, 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 we've had a good, uh, good time up here, uh, bitten off a good chunk of, of, of the issues here. Is there any questions from the floor? Uh, I would remind you that, uh, again, it's, it's, it's not often we, we, um, we can get the, the Vice President to... to come out here and be prepared to take questions. Sir, just at the front here, third row. Could you just state your name yes. and your, Thank your you. group? Andrew, I'm Steve Groff from the OECD in Paris. Um, a quick question about traditional donors, which our group works with. Uh, in 2005, uh, traditional donors committed to increase official development assistance by $50 billion by 2010, and we now know that they've missed that target by $19 billion, creating a fairly significant credibility gap. I think that in, even so, most of that um, missed target is under performance in a parallel commitment to double aid to Sub-Saharan Africa. That credibility gap still exists, I think, <coughs> in this region. So given that credibility gap, given the rise of non-traditional donors in the region, given the increased role of programs like Tony's that are not dependent on traditional donors for financing, given the role of the private sector, given the role that, given the fact that this type of funds represents an increasingly tiny share of, of financial flows in the region. I'd be interested in what the panel thinks about the role of traditional OECD donors in financing and, and helping Asia achieve the MDGs in the, in the next few years. Okay, could I start perhaps with, with uh, Thomas? Would you like to, or Jeffrey? Uh, the uh, traditional uh, official development assistance is in crisis uh, for the reasons you said. Uh, I wouldn't uh, want to uh, just pardon that crisis. I think there's a supreme moral hazard 
involved when uh, Wall Street takes home much more in bonuses uh, than uh, the United States gives in development assistance to the poorest countries of the world. So simply condoning this would be to condone very, very bad mistakes uh, uh, geopolitically, in, in my opinion, and I don't think there's any condoning. At the same time, one has to be, uh, one ha one has to be uh, agile uh, in response. There are a lot of new donors coming in. Uh, China, of course, is uh, a, perhaps the major financier of infrastructure in Africa right now. This is a wonderful development, in, in my opinion, very, very positive. Uh, the Gulf countries are stepping up tremendously uh, their uh, donations. Korea is becoming a significant donor. Brazil is becoming a significant donor. This, after all, is the way of the world. The leading role of the West uh, is uh, being uh, now matched by rising powers all over the world. And uh, in my view, that uh, makes sense. It's part of the overall rebalancing of the world economy uh, as catching up occurs, which we're all in favor of. And that means responsibility as well. But I don't want to let uh, my own country, the United States, uh, off the hook because we make a profound mistake when we invest 25 times more in military than we do in development assistance. We're not going to get the kind of outcomes that we need for a safer world. Uh, when we invest more in bonuses on Wall Street, even after the financial collapse, uh, than we do in development assistance for poor countries, this is just mistakes uh, that uh, don't do anybody any good, and we shouldn't, uh, therefore, just uh, slough it off as, uh, as an inevitable uh, development. It is a mistake that needs to be corrected. Tony? Well, uh, that was a good question, uh, Steve. Because we have been able to really uh, uh, help support the MDG without support from traditional donors, from foreign aid, but just depending on the greatness of the human spirit. And, uh, and, uh, if, if, and, and also now, because we, uh, we have, uh, if there is hope, then people will, will be transcendent. And uh, that's the reason why I said about even our politicians, if you connect with the good in them, they can also win elections by doing good. And so, but it's important for us to be trustworthy ourselves because right now a lot of people want to help our country. And, uh, and so, but they're looking for people they can trust as a bridge and, uh, and uh, even investments in, in social entrepreneurship. So I do believe that, uh, that uh, this is uh, the age of Asians coming together as, as family, as friends, as partners in development. And the East and the West looking at one another as one global cap family, building a just, a kinder, and a, a safer world. And, and so, uh, for us, though working on the ground, if uh, now in our, in, our, in our country, our government is working with us in developing social entrepreneurship, helping us in uh, working with us through agriculture in countryside development, and even uh, using us as a bridge for science and technology to those at the bottom of the pyramid. And so, if we can tweak even our educational system, that we can have what we call raise the SQ, the social quotient of our people, because we have people who are very smart. You have high IQ, high EQ, but poor SQ. But then, so that's, that's, the re, that, that's how we can build a better world. If, and big bus, we're using money from big business, philanthropy, CSR, to build templates for the next phase, which is empowerment of communities. And so more and more corporations are also investing in us in really sustainable uh, development in building uh, empowered citizenship because this will expand the market base and create more peace. You, 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 you're nodding your head there. I mean, is, is, this, is this a blueprint that you see here? Of course, this is very important. I think we also have to be agile and tap into every part of uh, the human spirit that we can, just as uh, Tony said. Some of it can be corporate uh, social investment. Uh, some of it needs to be development assistance. Some of it needs to be domestic resource mobilization. This is a huge uh, human effort uh, and global effort. No part uh, can, uh, no part alone is going to solve it, uh, and uh, no nobody, I believe, can be allowed to escape the responsibility. Uh, I also think it's a matter of smart investment. Uh, if you spend seven hundred billion dollars on the military per year and thirty billion dollars on development aid, 
you're not going to have an effective foreign policy. That's another practical uh, implication. And so it's a matter of being smart in, in this world uh, as well. Roger, next. I couldn't agree more with both uh, Jeffrey and Tony, but just like to emphasize a point, and I suppose I can say this since I'm from Asia, and that is I think Asian economies which have been doing well now need to step up to the plate and be more charitable or more importantly more generous in their support for the region. I think the traditional donors will come to the plate, maybe with some pulling and pushing, if they see that the region is also taking care of itself. I think gone are the days when we can look to the West to help us out and say, look, you need to do it. I think China, India, many other economies in the region which are doing well have to become more generous, have to become more involved, and then expect the traditional donors to continue their support. Uh, Vice President Floriano, do you think the Indonesian government is generous enough, or do you think uh, it is going to require still more spending to meet the sort of targets that you want to hit on the MDGs? Yeah. I think the government <coughs> cannot get away from the, the uh, responsibility to, to uh, achieve these uh, social goals. I think there's, there's uh, a responsibility that uh, uh, is attached uh, to any government. <coughs> and I think uh, for the next uh, decade or so, uh, the, the role of the government to, to intervene, to uh, do or whatever it could to, to uh, achieve the social goals for the nation is, is imperative. And especially for, in the case of Indonesia, Mr. Stevens, <coughs> Indonesia is a rather big country. I think the area spans beyond Europe, I guess, and the dis disparities are still there between the regions. And therefore, I think the role of central government is imperative in this case. So uh, whatever we, we do, I think we, we, we will be still in the center of the, 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 uh, the action, the central government. And uh, if I would like to also relate to the the uh, the comment from the the floor, mm. that in my view the the role of traditional aid is should not be over uh, overestimated in my view. Uh, the more the more promising area is actually in the area of giving us a better trade deal, better in investment uh. deals. What I mean is that people, uh, the more developed countries should give us uh, to, uh, rooms where we can develop ourselves within here in terms of better trade uh, arrangement, in terms of better investment uh, arrangement. I don't think this is uh, uh, still the time for everyone to get cheap raw materials and uh, Mm. And, you, and uh, transport back to the, the home country and process there. I think now investors should try to understand that I think it is for the best interest in the long term that they, they should uh, put the uh, operations more in the area where the, the resources are there and share the value added with the, with the, uh, the countries. Uh, in that way, I think uh, we should be uh, freed from the idea that, well, we have to rely on traditional aids and tradi traditional donors and so on. I think the best way is, is to come to understand where trade and investment, we can have a, a better, uh, what you call, share, mm. sharing and, and uh, cooperation in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Um, I, I want to return to, to the sustainability issue. and, and Number seven on the target, uh, environmental sustainability, making sure that uh, we have the growth and we reach the goals without destroying the environment on the way. Um, first of all, Rajat Nag, uh, as a lender, how stringent have you become on environmental issues? Increasingly so, but not in the sense of a diktat, not because you know we think it must be done and the countries don't. Uh, I think there has been a very strong acceptance 
of the need for the highest internationally best practice environmental standards. So in all our lending, all our projects have to comply with them, and we insist that the best practices are followed, not just environment, but also on the social safeguards with respect to, say, resettlement, rights of the indigenous people. These have now become part of the standard package of all our requirements for lending to any country. Thomas, do you, um, th with sustainability now, <coughs> how deeply entrenched is it? Well, the environment, and especially climate change, is the defining challenge for our country, as Secretary General has mentioned several times. So if we look at what is happening, if we look at uh, East Asia, you know, of course, you know, with the rapid development, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are exploding. You know, there's no doubt about that. On the other hand, we also have good developments. You know, we have a gain of 2.2 million hectares of forests every year in the region here with the rapid afforestation programs in some of the countries here. So we have to balance that. Uh, and it's pretty much, you know, we are not telling governments what to do at the United Nations. We advise governments. Mm -hmm. And it's up to governments to set the parameters. But it's up to governments to, for example, direct investment flows. It's up to governments to decide whether this we subsidize or keep subsidizing fossil fuels, nuclear energy, or whether we try to subsidize renewables. This is going to be very important. And as the Secretary General in Davos at the last World Economic Forum said, we are on a suicidal track right now. We need nothing less than a revolution. And as Jeff said, we need a total rethinking of our production and consumption patterns to really meet the 50-50-50 challenge uh, in Rio and in the year leading up to Rio. These are huge challenges. I would like to, go to, to just mention two more challenges uh, which are specific to the region but not only and which are sometimes a little bit undervalued. When we look at the MDGs, which are all interconnected, which are the drivers? How can we increase the rate of return? And there are two issues which are at my heart. One is gender, MDG3. Now, this region has made a lot of progress in uh, access of women, of girls, to primary education and to education as such. But when you look at the job markets, when you look at parliamentary representation, we have a long way to go, not only in this region, but all over the world. So gender is something which we know really drives development and uh, facilitates implementation of the MDGs. Another issue which I want to raise is decent work. You, know, mm -hmm. you need to provide income to people, predictable income with a certain rights-based income. Otherwise, people cannot decide about their future. How can you build, invest in a house? How can you build a family? How can you take your life into your own hands if you're excluded, if you don't have decent work, uh, if you're dependent on arbitrary decisions? So this is very important. And in the rebounding of the financial crisis, one of the issues which worries me very much <coughs> is jobless growth. And we have seen where it leads to, the science at the wall. You know, we have seen in the last month in regions where we have 30% youth unemployment, where people have lost their faith in the institutions, where the social contract is evaporating, is weakened to an extent that people stand up and really uh, improve their situation by starting revolutions. You know? And this is science we see everywhere in the world, social unrest, not only in North Africa, MENA. We have seen this in Europe. We have seen this in many countries where people go on the street, they take their life into their hands and they protest. So inclusive growth, equitable growth, sharing, equitable taxation to finance the global goods, that's at the root of the development we want to see and we think is sustainable. Jeffrey Sachs, just on that point, I mean, uh, is, is, there, is there a sense that uh, there, there, there is a, a, a problem with um, you know, what, what's going on as far as equitable development goes in, in Asia? Let, let me, uh, if I could, take up the sustainability issue just for yep. one moment, uh, just to say how hard it is, not that that's news. The uh, International Energy Agency last week released uh, the most recent data for 2010. They showed that the greenhouse gases continue to increase year by year. Uh, so we're not yet even on a path of stabilizing the greenhouse gas emissions, which are at a level annually which will wreck the planet 
within a few decades, and we're already in the midst of the turmoil. It's no longer about the future. We're already in the age of climate instability. I left New York City yesterday, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We've already become a tropical city, uh, and uh, that may not be so shocking here, uh, but uh, we're in the mid-latitudes, uh, which means that we're already in the midst of, I believe, a great deal of turmoil ahead, agricultural crisis, food crisis, water scarcity, uh, ecological scarcity. Nobody uh, is facing up to this uh, adequately yet, starting with my own country, because our Congress <laughs> is in the hands of the oil lobby. Uh, this is the basic point. So we've had 20 years of immobility in the U.S. Congress because oil and big coal hold the Congress in their midst. But then when the U.S. is inactive, China says, well, we can't lead if the United States isn't even leading. Then the two biggest emitters in the world uh, don't act adequately. And then all the rest of the countries say, hey, what about us? We're, we're just in the passenger seat here. So I want to emphasize this is so central but let's not be thinking that because there are some wind turbines and there are some other things that somehow we're on top of this yet. We're talking about the core of the economy. Uh, and wherever there's powerful oil or mining interests, whether it's Australia, whether it's the United States, whether it's Canada, these lobbies are holding the whole world in their grip right now. Do you think this is a place where Asia can lead then? Where what? Where Asia can lead. Well, I think Asia is, by being the most crowded place on the planet, and by having tremendous water stress, actually is incredibly vulnerable. If there's one thing that's going to trip up Asia's long term, the Asia century, it's not going to be governance, because that will be solved. It's actually going to be the environment. This is the biggest threat to Asia's long term success of making this the Asian century. You have dryness in the North China Plains. You have the Indo-Gangetic Valley with hundreds of millions of people uh, depending on water supplies that are collapsing mm. right now. Uh, you have the uh, drama in the Himalayan uh, origins of the great river systems of Asia. Asia is so crowded uh, with four billion people and rising uh, and huge environmental risks this is the central challenge for Asia, so Asia has to lead. Uh, I'm sorry to say the United States is going to be a follower in this. Uh, our lobbies have not been broken yet. Uh, they, they are mainly polluting not only in greenhouse gases, but also in anti-scientific misinformation every day. Uh, and uh, therefore, Asia is going to have to step up and say, look, we're doing it, and the United States, you better follow us. And, and, and one country specifically here would be Indonesia, uh, Vice President, an incredibly environmentally significant country, um, enormous rainforest, enormous biodiversity. <coughs> How does the environment and environmental protection rate? This is a question we, we, we talked about a little bit earlier. How does that, how do you balance that against a need for economic growth to bring people out of poverty, to bring people into, into, middle, into the middle class. How difficult is it? Is it, is it doable? It is. I think it is doable. Uh, well, looking in, in within our context, Indonesia, I think the resources are still there to improve the living standard of our people for, for many, many years to come. So. Uh, I think uh, human being should should be put first, of course, environment also. But I think you, the uh, the goals to improve uh, uh, the living standard of human being is, is should come first. And here, I think you, you cannot compromise with that. But of course, uh, environment is is very key. I, I agree with uh, what uh, the emphasis, what uh, Professor Sachs mentioned, that uh, there is a here in in Asia. <coughs> The, uh, the trade-off between uh, growth, improvement in standard of living, and environment is, is uh, very, very uh, uh, sharp here. But uh, I think that should be recognized by everybody. But within Indonesia itself, I think what we should do is really to, to aim at some uh, reasonable, practical uh, 
uh, rate of economic growth, uh, I mentioned earlier, 7 to 8% growth, mm. with good quality, good uh, uh, distribution in, in, uh, site, and so on. But that would, of course, uh, have to come from uh, a better technologies and so on. I think that this kind of thing can be worked out. Do, do, excuse me, if I just interrupt, does an emerging economy like Indonesia need support? Do, do you need help to protect your environment for the betterment of, of mankind, of humankind? So therefore, do you need support from beyond Indonesia's borders? Oh, yes, yes. I think, In what uh, way? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Stephen. I think the, uh, uh, let's take our forest. Our forest has given benefit to ourselves, of course, but beyond. Indonesia, and that, that is, I think, the key area that we should work together. Uh, how to preserve this uh, environmental asset uh, of the world uh, together. And I, I think uh, we, we are open to that. And we have uh, announced ourselves that we, we would do uh, our part, including now, as I mentioned, the government has already uh, announced the moratorium of the conversion of forest land. And we, we, ha we have embarked on a rather ambitious replanting program. And this, all this needs, of course, uh, some support from <coughs> everywhere. And we, we are wel we can, welcome. Can, can you specifically say what sort of support you would like to s your country to have? Yeah. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, actually, the sport may not, doesn't have to be a very direct support, uh, uh, but should be a, a kind of uh, overall support for our economy to, to develop in, in the uh, appropriate uh, path. And that I include, of course, the, uh, as I mentioned, investment and trade deals mm -hmm. itself. I think we should not forget that. But of course, uh, Directly, uh, the uh, international <coughs> community could help us in, in the area of managing our forests and so on. Uh, that's, that's very, very useful. All right. Um, gentlemen, I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap this up. Um, I'd just like to say that my takeaway from this is, you know, it, it, we talk about the Asian century now. We talk about the Asian century in terms of its economic growth and its economic story. But it is also becoming increasingly where it is Asia's century in leadership and in leadership with reaching things like NDCs, with protecting the environment. It's a big challenge. Um, we have governments who are listening and we have um, activists, radical optimists who are prepared to help. It's a huge, it's a huge step forward, but uh, I think a uh, fora like this does help to push the agenda forward. I'd just like to, to thank our panel for coming, particularly the Vice President of Indonesia, Pak, um, Pak Bordiono, and uh, to everybody, thanks for coming this morning. Thank you.